All right, team, let's dive back into traumatic brain injury lecture here for the paramedic student. Move, moving on and wrapping up with assessment and management of traumatic brain injuries. To get started, I'd like to separate these into two major categories of treatment before we start going down the line. So the idea here is that there's kind of two major categories for our general treatment of patients with traumatic brain injuries, and they're split into the worst case situation and everything else. The worst case situation being patients that have impending herniation, right? The realization that the patient is showing signs and symptoms to us that indicate that the brain has got so much increased intracranial pressure in it that it shifted parts of the brain structure and is now putting pressure down on the brain stem. Remember our discussion on autoregulation and how the body tries to manage those changes in pressure when there's a bleed, and it essentially makes itself a little bit worse in the process. So it'll get worse and worse, faster and faster, as the patient's body tries to compensate. And we get signs like, uh, for instance, Cushing's triad. Everything else on the traumatic brain injury management spectrum is going to be uh, either not going to progress to that level, it's not as severe, or it's pretty far from progressing to that level. We don't have signs of it yet in patients. So in traumatic brain injuries in general, generalized treatment, we're really just going to, I know it's kind of lame, but say we could support signs and symptoms for our patients. We want to have a hallmark of limiting the risk of patients suffering a secondary brain injury, right? So we want to make sure that we're preventing hypovolemia, we want to prevent hypoxia, all of those things because the brain is still trying to, to deal with its primary brain injury. And if we aren't managing their signs and symptoms well enough, the risk is they have a secondary on top of that. So we're not going to be making big changes to the patient's vital signs by way of our treatment in the case of traumatic brain injuries that are not herniating. But when we get to the patients that do have signs of impending herniation, we may need to change their end tidal CO2 level a little bit by mitigating their ventilatory pattern. In that goal, our end tidal CO2 is our titrated value, and we're seeking to bring them, if they have impending herniation, uh, to a hypocapnia level of 30 to 35 millimeters of mercury. Now, this is not hyperventilation, right? No hyperventilation. Not to say that we're going to leave their ventilatory rate the way it is, but we're probably not going outside of the normal ventilatory range to do this. And this has limited benefit. If we overshoot it, then this actually will cause more damage to the patient's brain than if we had just stuck with our tra traditional traumatic brain injury management to begin. So let's kind of dive in now into each of these sec sections of the ABCs, uh, the XABCs, uh, excuse me, and we'll look at some points to consider. Of course, patients may also have, in addition to their head injuries, uh, multi-systems trauma, and they may be suffering a, the competing mechanisms of a patient suffering something like an uncontrolled internal hemorrhage in their body uh, or external hemorrhage and having a traumatic brain injury. And those are very difficult cases. For the most part here, I'll give you the caution that you want to make sure you can separate those two things and know what they look like when maybe both are present so that you can identify because we're going to be limited somewhat to our central nervous system treatment by the limits of whatever our uh, internal hemorrhage treatment is going to be. So with our primary assessment, aggressively look for any bleeding, control that bleeding so that we can keep the red blood cells in the body. Again, it's not just about having pressure, it's about having enough oxygen to get to the brain in the first place. We may need to manage the patient's airway, but there could be C-spine precautions, so make sure that we're utilizing the best path for managing the prevention of C-spine injuries when we manage their airway, maybe even up to the level of having intubate. Again, airway and ventilatory management, all trying to prevent secondary brain injuries in the process. Now, in some cases, we do have to intubate patients that have traumatic brain injuries. Even if they're not necessarily impending herniation, the trauma to the brain may have been so severe that their level of consciousness just isn't going to be supported well enough uh, for their airway. And so there are some cautions, though, again, to the idea that secondary brain injury from hypoxia can worsen the effects of the first or primary brain injury. We want to make sure that when we're intubating, our skills are up because there are suggestions and data that uh, inexperienced provider intubations have been correlated with the higher mortality rate. And there's no real, uh, this isn't to say anything negative about the paramedic out there. It's really to, to say that one, we need more training time. That's just something everybody could get more of. So practice those intubations if you're not getting a lot of them. And then two, the environments we do this in and the patients that we're doing this in aren't really textbook or operating room um, quality in that sense of being prepped and, and having an environment in which we can work.
If we are intubating, we may want to consider a few things. Um, intubating or not, we always want to try and maintain patients' uh, oxygen saturation. And again, speaking back to the needs of the brain, uh, needing to consume so much oxygen just when the brain isn't injured, let alone now that it's trying to fight for its life. And so we can do this a few ways. If you're going to have to intubate, you really want to try and get that ideal two to three minutes of pre-oxygenation uh, going with 100% oxygen by VVM while you know in the classroom we say you're prepping your gear. Now that two to three minutes is a number that's really not necessarily for trauma, it's, it's a general number to try and pre-oxygenate and bring up patients' saturations. So that also applies to things uh, like, like medical intubation as well. So realize that our goal here is to help their oxygen saturation get high enough that when we stop ventilating them and we dive into their airway and we start digging around and trying to get maybe what is a difficult airway, they're not going to desat so far that they put the brain's oxygenation and blood flow at risk. And so if we can't make the two to three minutes, let's try and make it as high oxygen saturation as we can before we start that intubation. Also, when we're in the patient's airway, the stimulation of the equipment and us using things like suction in the patient's airway is going to likely cause a sympathetic response. And that sympathetic response is going to make the intracranial pressure go up even momentarily as we try to intubate. So administering lidocaine is to blunt that uh, sympathetic effect when we intubate. And some suggestions in uh, protocols uh, indicate giving one to two milligrams per kilogram of lidocaine IV push before intubating, uh, a, a few minutes before intubating so that it can take its effect. And the goal here is that it's likely doing this through its sodium channel blocking mechanism and kind of decreases the rate at which these neurons are going to send the signal that shows an increase in cardiovascular response and could be correlated with an increase in ICP. So something to think about and look for out there in the field. Now, when we're managing patients that are <clears throat> uh, that have a head injury, but we don't see signs of impending herniation yet, we're still kind of in that camp for this set of slides here. So we want to maintain the patient's ventilatory rate that's adequate to get off the right amount of CO2 and bring in the right amount of oxygen. And so that's normally going to be a range within the normal adult uh, ventilation range. The patient may be breathing on their own, and so we may have to time our ventilations if they're maybe breathing too slow uh, to bring their ventilation into that normal range. So kind of feel for that in your patient's breathing and understand what they can and can't do on their own so we can supplement them well. And tidal CO2 here is going to be the low normal range. Giving them a little bit of uh, opportunity to blow off some CO2 is going to be somewhat beneficial in changing the vasoconstriction and vasodilation of the brain that's kind of leading to this ICP. But note, we're still within the normal range here if we don't see herniation. If we're in a situation in which we only have the ability to measure one or the other or take action on one or the other versus a SpO2 or an end-tidal CO2 monitor. I think putting an end-tidal CO2 monitor is something you should do on all traumatic brain injury patients because, one, we're going to use it for management if this does go to a route where they have the worst-case scenario and in increasing intracranial pressure. Two, though, it can tell us a lot, and we can still try and maintain good ventilation to keep them in that normal range to give them a little bit of protection inside their brain. So although the end tidal CO2 is really valuable, if you have to choose between the two, I would say if your SpO2 is reliable <clears throat> based on the patient and the, your equipment, then I would go with the SpO2 so that you can titrate the oxygen level. That's really what the brain needs. So if we can get it the oxygen it needs, we may not need to mess around with changing some of the end tidal CO2 uh, values in the meantime. And we'll have also the most direct effect on giving patients oxygen and changing their SAT. That happens more quickly than trying to change their end tidal CO2 value. When we're assessing patients' ventilations, anticipate that patients that have any sort of pressure or decrease in oxygenation or blood flow to the brainstem, especially where our pons and medulla are located, might change patients' ventilatory patterns as a result. And if we've gotten to that point, if we're changing the patient, if the disease is changing the patient's ventilatory patterns, it probably has already had an impact on the midbrain, which is where we get our sleep-wakeful cycle uh, tied to the RAS. So we may have varying changes in ventilation and changes in the patient's LOC as well. Uh, on all of these, it's a graph form, so I'll just show you the normal. So this is the time axis on X, Y axis is tidal volume. Uh, looking at these, I would say biot and ataxia you can put into the same category. Ataxic meaning they don't really have a coordinated ventilatory pattern. They're kind of just uh, beating uh, somewhat chaotically. Chain Stokes has an irregular, but it's definitely a pattern that's present. And so the rhythm of Chain Stokes starts off, if we're kind of seeing it in its full, in, uh, its full pattern, it starts off with a period of apnea, and then we have fast, shallow breathing that gets deeper and slower till it gets to a crescendo, goes back down 
till it gets a little bit faster and shallow and then gets to a point of apnea. And it repeats this cycle over and over again. Now, if you're seeing one of these over the other, I think it's really not important to say what, what area is uh, impacted currently. I think it's important to say if any of these abnormal vital ventilatory rates are showing, you're probably dealing with an impending herniation coming down the road. Now, when we have patients with impending herniation, we do go a little bit more aggressive in management of the patient's uh, cerebral perfusion. So we're going to apply or supply the opportunity for the patient to blow off a little more CO2 than they would normally do so. And the indications for this include asymmetric pupils, so pupillary changes on assessment, dilated non-reactive pupils, any type of posturing or no response uh, when you're uh, completing your GCS, Neurologic deterioration, so this is really to speak of having serial GCS scores. Also, if we see those vital signs associated with Cushing's triad, uh, the elevated blood pressure, the low heart rate, and the abnormal ventilations, that's also a good indication of herniation as well. When we have those signs of impending herniation, it's time for us to kind of bring out the riskiest but hopefully most beneficial tool to these patients. And so it used to be taught or, or was commonly known anyways as some hyperventilation treatment. Well, we're not going to hyperventilate these patients because we're not going to ventilate outside of their normal range. Really, what we're trying to do is increase their minute volume or their ventilatory rate so that they blow off just enough CO2 that they get into a hypocapnic or low range on entitled CO2. So it probably will still be within the normal ventilatory rate ranges for these patients when we're ventilating uh, to, to blow off this extra CO2. And we're not going to go outside of those bounds. Now, the risk here, though, is that if we do breathe too fast, the patient will blow off way too much CO2 and become not just a little bit hypocapnic, but severely. When that happens, that hyperventilation is going to bypass the autoregulation process that's happening in the brain. And to some degree, that can be helpful. But if we overstep those boundaries, it will certainly restrict blood flow and cause potentially more pressure. The process to that is to kind of say the mass effect essentially will get worse. Excess vasoconstriction is going to occur if we're hyperventilating and getting into that dangerous realm of very low end tidal CO2. That's going to decrease cerebral uh, blood flow. It's going to lead to the, the grounds that are ready for an ischemic injury. Ischemic tissue in the brain has edema, so it occupies now more space, so there's a higher mass effect of brain tissue. And that eventually increases ICP, making this condition potentially even worse. So we manage patients' airways in traumatic brain injuries because likely they have an airway problem, literally vomiting or increased secretions or maybe even facial trauma, and the patient uh, likely is not protecting their airway because of a change in the LOC. And so those are some of the reasons we might have to in traumatic brain injury. What options do we have for airway management in traumatic brain injury patients? Well, it depends to a degree what their actual injury is. And so we'll want to use caution with things like nasal tubes when we're managing patients that we suspect may have some fracture that's opened the inside of their facial cavity to the inside of the cranium. And that might be highest at risk in patients that have basal or skull fractures. So something to consider, which tools can you utilize? Also, patients may be seizing or they, they may have trismus in which their teeth are clenched. You can't open their airway orally. So it just really depends on their signs and symptoms, as mentioned before. What are the indications for intubation? Well, we don't want to delay scene time uh, with these high uh, special, speciality skills, we want to try and maintain a quick off-scene time and then do as much as we can in the ambulance. So part of that is driving the airway decision that you're making. So if you have a patient that you can't secure an airway with, meaning you can't ventilate successfully with BLS maneuvers, you're probably going to have to manage that airway at another level right now on the scene. If your patient's airway can get some breaths in and make it to the ambulance without causing a large risk of the patient having things like uh, uh, aspiration, uh, then that patient likely would be able to have BLS maneuvers into, until you get in the truck, in which time you start transporting and hopefully get an ALS uh, airway in place. So those are kind of some of the decisions you're going to have to make in patients that are presenting with airway issues in traumatic brain injuries. Make sure that we're, again, reassessing patients' circulatory status. We want to try and maintain normal body temperature for these patients, similar to what we would do in patients that are in shock. We're trying to limit hypotension, so make sure that we're uh, taking in their global consideration when we do things like start IV push fluid. 
Remember that we have parameters in patients that we're giving fluid to to try and manage their MAP or their systolic blood pressure, uh, dependent on whether we have an external, an internal, or an uh, isolated central nervous system injury. So in isolated central nervous system injuries, we want to try and maintain uh, mean arterial pressure somewhere around 90 millimeters of mercury. Again, though, if we're managing a patient that already also has a risk of bleeding out, we may not be able to get those pressures high uh, in the presence of shock. You want to reassess GCS, a very valuable tool. Changes in GCS can be subtle when we're looking at them independently, but when you trend them, you get to see uh, changes as they're happening and with at least a little warning in some cases. Evaluate the patient's pupils. Make sure you're making a good determination on the patient's need for cervical stabilization. And if patients are having seizures, which may come about because of the traumatic brain injury that they've sustained, we're going to have to weigh what's this going to do to their cerebral perfusion pressure versus what happens if we don't treat the seizure uh, with something like a benzodiazepine. So we generally wouldn't give benzodiazepines to patients that have a traumatic brain injury if they didn't have a seizure present. We wouldn't generally utilize it uh, for means of sedation in these patients. So the risk is that if they are sedated from this medication, they may change their blood pressure a degree and they may start hypoventilating, which will both increase the risk of secondary brain injury for these patients. So if they do have a seizure, that likely out, outweighs the immediate other risks. So you'll probably be treating it just enough till that seizure stops and then thinking about cerebral perfusion pressure and blood flow as you move on. Some things to consider, these are generalities in patients that have traumatic brain injuries. When patients have uh, blunt force trauma to their head, that usually comes about with mechanisms that will cause the head to move in a way that likely moves the cervical spine. And so blunt force trauma is likely an indication to evaluate injuries in cervical spine uh, when assessing patients. When we have patients that have uh, a blunt force injury and we're suspecting a spinal, or maybe there is a spinal injury on top of it with, with confirmation, um, we don't want to put the C-collar too tight because if it's restricting that return blood flow, that's going to cause a backup in the system and cause an increase in intracranial pressure, obviously making their condition worse. Now, there are some treatments that we might otherwise use that could be dangerous in patients that have increasing intracranial pressure, and we don't want to add to that. So here I've listed some of the things that we may do, maybe not on every patient, but these are things that we may do that could increase the patient's intracranial pressure, and so we want to try and limit them or really consider their use when managing. Intubation and RSI attempts are going to increase intracranial pressure we've talked before. Increasing PEEP greater than 15 centimeters of water uh, when we're doing things like PEEP added to BVM can increase intracranial pressure. Direct pressure on a cranial fracture, so applying too much pressure to a skull fracture, putting pressure down back into the brain will certainly do so. Too tight of a seat collar, as we mentioned, that blood won't drain from uh, the cranium, and so it'll back up. And then elevating the patient's legs or chandelion position, generally not something we consider doing in patients with head injuries. That extra blood flow drainage that gravity is going to produce is going to increase the pressure in the abdomen, the chest, and eventually that will translate to increasing pressure in the brain as well. Sometimes we have to remove patients with traumatic brain injuries from vehicles very rapidly, likely because we think that there's a risk that staying in the vehicle and us taking our time might make that patient's condition worse, or it's a dangerous situation and they can suffer other injuries. And so what are those indications? Really, if we're going to decrease some of the special steps we would do to protect patients from injuries when removing them, if we're going to stop using those uh, things, we've got to have a pretty good reason for them. So again, this is something that we're facing that is a threat to, to life limb uh, on this patient or their condition warrants that we just need to get them out so we can do what we need to on the side. This slides out of our textbook and lists a couple of the different things that can cause changes and elevations along the spectrum of increasing intracranial pressure. Now, aside from the primary brain injury treatment that we just went to, now you're going to be exploring other causes, looking at other pertinent positives and negatives in your patient's condition, and weighing other injuries that you might find in your secondary assessment. So in patients that have underlying medical conditions that inhibit or change clotting, or maybe dehydrate the brain over time, they may be at greater risk of severe injury with lower amounts of energy applied. So something to consider in our medical history. A single episode of our patients experiencing a blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure in less than 90 millimeters of mercury, when the patient has an isolated uh, 
central nervous system injury can lead to poor outcomes. And so that's documented, again, us making sure that we give adequate perfusion. Manage the ischemic threats that are occurring, and that may slow down the progression of ICP in your patients uh, while you buy some time to transport. Of course, manage hypotension in the presence of shock a little differently. Uh, we're not going to be getting as high as pressures for the central nervous system because we're trying to make sure that we don't make the underlying internal hemorrhage worse. Be on the lookout for blood sugar changes. Patients, especially if they've got a lot of brain activity, they're seizing, those patients are going to consume more sugar. And without sugar, brain cells become ischemic, they swell, and they contribute to the negative outcome in these patients. Now, giving a patient medications that may be damaging to the brain when they leave the blood vessels, like dextrose, is a concern. And so if you have a patient that has low blood sugar and in the presence of a traumatic brain injury, and we assume that when we push all this really thick sugar into their IV, it will leak into their brain and cause necrosis and obviously more catastrophic damage. The balance is to try and determine whether or not you need to go that route and put them at risk. So if the patient has a low blood sugar, we're going to have to intervene. If that continues, the patient's going to get worse uh, without our intervention, and so we're obligated to intervene. So if we are going to be utilizing things like dextrose, Make sure that we're giving it uh, very judiciously, give the small amount that we need to get their blood sugar to go back up and try not to overshoot the boundary so we're not flooding that space. You may have diluted uh, that and pushed very, very slowly to try and give a little bit more um, uh, fluid content when it reaches the brain. So we're just going to do so carefully because we do need to bring up their blood sugar. Some things to consider in transporting patients with traumatic brain injuries. The facility you're going to take them to is obviously largely dependent on the facilities you have available to you. Generally, a level one trauma center, though, would have the resources necessary to manage patients with traumatic brain injuries. The ideal receiving facility needs to have a CT scanner, ICP monitoring capability, and a neurosurgeon on staff that can respond in a short period of time and on short notice. Those patients are likely going to have, during your care and in the hospital, very frequent reassessment needs to make sure that we don't see dramatic changes or lose a vital sign uh, or some stabilization of their airway that we once had before. Don't elevate the patient's head of the bed greater than 30 degrees in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, when we're managing patients, a medium to low Fowler's is just fine, or even supine would be acceptable. If we elevate the head too high, we're going to change the pressure drainage, and that will change blood flow to the brain again. All right, that's a lot of info. I hope it's helpful to you uh, to review these topics. Uh, we're done with our head trauma section, so we'll be moving on to the next lecture in spine trauma. Thanks, everybody.